Welcome to Stukent Expert Sessions. The presentation will begin shortly. Hello everyone, my name is Fabio Castro, a PhD student here at MIT. And today we'll talk about supply chain management as a workshop for the book, The Principles of Supply Chain Management and Operations by Danica Porter. More specifically, we'll talk about uh, supply chain management for offshore oil exploration and for the supply of uh, micro and small retailers. So let's get started. And just a brief overview about my background. Uh, before joining MIT, I was a petroleum drilling engineer and logistics manager for an oil company. And then later I moved to humanitarian logistics by joining the Doctors for the Borders in South Sudan. And then I came to MIT to complete the master's in supply chain management, where I was a colleague of uh, Danica Porter. And now I have proceeded to the PhD in supply chain management, where my research uh, project studies supply of small stores in developing countries. And today we are going to talk about two of these topics uh, that are very diverse. Uh, first, the logistics for offshore oil drilling and the logistics for, uh, for micro retailing in developing countries. So for the first topic, what's offshore oil drilling? So just a brief review. Uh, when we talk about uh, offshore oil drilling, we'll be talking about uh, a drilling platform, drilling for oil uh, in water depths that range between just 10 meters up to 3,000 meters uh, in the deep ocean. And uh, it drew a well some kilometers below the sea bottom, up to a total well depth of, that has been reached more than 10,000 meters. And so the operations of drilling just one single well takes between two and five months, costing $1 million per day. So we're talking about uh, drilling each well costing around $100 million for each well. And this operation requires a lot of logistics behind it. Uh, we need a supply base, and here's an image of uh, Port Fouchon in Louisiana. That's the largest supply offshore base here in the United States. And uh, also need some uh, supply vessels to transport equipment and helicopters to transport personnel uh, to the drilling rig. And additional to oil exploration, the other topic we'll talk about is the logistics for micro and small firms, more specifically in developing countries. And here we'll show some examples of micro and small retailers in developing countries. And you can see that these are really very small businesses and isolated they are, the logistics is very simple. The logistics of each of these stores is very simple. It's just one owner that buys and sells product. However, when you look from above and consider all the small stores in large cities, such as Mexico City, and think about the perspective of their suppliers, which are major companies like Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola, which are the suppliers of all of these small stores, uh, the supplier has a problem of supplying hundreds of thousands of these stores and they want to supply all the stores because in developing countries, that's where most of their sales margin, that's where the most of the margin for Porto and Gamble and Coca-Cola are. It's in these small um, stores that hold the, the majority of the market share. So pause and think for a while how to supply efficiently all of these small stores every week. And it looks more like a postal service logistics, delivering small packages to multiple locations uh, which is very different than when they supply large supermarkets like Walmart. The logistics between supplying all these many small stores and supplying large supermarkets is very different. So these are the two settings we are looking at, the offshore oil drilling and the supply of small stores. And they are very different from another in aspects of transportation, procurement, process, finance and many others. The transportation of oil drilling includes supply vessels, helicopters, large trucks, and for small stores, you use trucks, sometimes very small trucks. Um, for the procurement for large oil projects is very integrated. Uh, it's a very integrated process with the suppliers uh, that use uh, internet communication and uh, large systems. While for small stores, the procurement of, of the small stores is usually just phone calls, text messages, or visitors, visits by a salesperson. The processes of oil companies are very integrated process um, among uh, the suppliers and the customers, while the processes, the supply chain process of small stores are very often uh, managed by just paper and pencil. And the finances are always also very different. Uh, 
the oil industry has access to large banks. Um, small stores usually don't have much working capital, and this also interferes how the supply chain, the logistics decisions of these two different industries work. So we'll follow here the same structure as Danica's book, and we'll go through all the topics of the book about the challenges of these two industries, how the planning of the, and the demand for cash works, the sourcing and procurement, the inventory management, the inventory models that I used, how is the transportation, the warehousing network modeling, the supply chain metrics, the global supply chain, and at last, uh, the supply chain coordination for each of these two industries, the oil exploration and the supply of micro retailers. Regarding the challenges, the challenges of these two industries are very different. For the oil industry, uh, it's a very dangerous environment. For example, here is an image of the accident of the deep hot water horizon in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010. So safety is always a major concern. We will be moving heavy equipment, using heavy machinery, and very often in very remote locations. For example, here is the port that we operate from Tanzania, uh, where actually we adapted a port that was operating for cashew nuts and brought installed equipment so that it could operate for our drilling project. On the other hand, the challenges for supplying to small stores are very different. Here is the map of Mexico City, and we want to supply small packs to all of these thousands of stores. Some of these stores don't have much working capital, they don't have much storage space, so we must adapt our operations to their characteristics, else our competitors will adapt to their characteristics and the stores will buy from our competitors. So we supply small uh, quantities every week uh, to these stores because they have nowhere to store large deliveries. We can't make large deliveries because very often their, um, their storage space is too small. And very often we'll deliver, uh, these deliveries will be in streets that just cannot fit large trucks or just don't have uh, parking space. So, given these challenges, we'll plan and forecast the demand. In the oil industry, we'll have a project schedule, so we'll know in advance when and where we're going to drill. So we can follow this operation schedule, the operation schedule of our operations, to inform how much our demand will be at each time, so that we plan our transportation, inventory, our supply. For supplying today's small stores, instead, we'll mostly have data of the past sales, historical data that can inform our future demand and where we can identify seasonalities and trends and then predict the future with uh, some uh, certainty and uncertainty. And we use this demand for cash to plan the sourcing and the procurement. In the oil companies, we are talking about uh, large contracts, multi million, multi billion dollar contracts. So we'll select the suppliers through auctions and other processes, and then we'll sign contracts in a global market with suppliers all over the world. And then we'll mobilize equipment from the entire globe from different locations. And this map shows, for example, the mobilization of equipment to one of our projects, where we mobilize the equipment from everywhere in the world. On the other hand, the sourcing by the small retailers is more often just the sales representative of their suppliers, like the sales representative of uh, Johnson & Johnson, Coca-Cola, going door to door, knocking the doors of the companies, talking to the owner to take the orders of the small stores. Or the same done by a salesperson of uh, the distributors representing the manufacturer. Um, and recently we collected this survey to find out how these small stores ordered the suppliers. And we see it's usually through phone calls, uh, some WhatsApp, um, and we already start to see some supply web pages so that the small stores order through the internet uh, or supply apps, supply apps that the stores can use for ordering. But as you can see, uh, it's a very different sourcing and ordering process compared to the large companies, for example, the oil companies. For the inventory management, first in the oil company, we can see here how we prepare the inventory. Uh, this picture here was taken on board one of our drilling rigs and we can see how we are storing in 
in this case mostly pipes and other equipment on board the drilling rig and uh, that's on the drilling site and we have some very limited inventory space in the rig so we hold a large part of our inventory in the supply base and here in the other image you can see the supply base where you can see mostly storing also pipes and everything is managed for a system on ERP um, enterprise resource planning software in this case SAP to manage the inventory in a very structured database for the small companies uh, these are pictures of re uh, retailers in Morocco they have uh, their products ev their products everywhere with very limited space uh, and our survey that we ran recently in Mexico, uh, our ask also asked how they manage their inventories. Uh, and we see that most uh, most stores don't track the inventories. Sometimes they just keep the inventories on paper. And some of them will use Excel, some of them, and some of them are already using some inventory management softwares or some inventory management uh, mobile apps for keeping track and managing the stocks of the store. And the way the inventory decisions are modeled and decided, they very much are related to how the demand looks or how the data looks like. For example, for our oil company, uh, we usually purchase or mobilize a certain amount, amount of equipment for a project. So uh, we, we decide how much equipment you're going to use and uh, based on our expected demand for that project there is always some uncertainty so this problem resembles if you think uh, slightly uh, like a, a single period model or the so-called news vendor model where we need to balance the expected costs of the stockouts with the expected costs of the excess stock for the manufacturers that are supplying the small stores or the distributors supplying the small stores they'll probably do something more like a continuous replenishment for example they'll replenish their own stocks every two or three weeks so they must always have enough stock for this race uh, stock period plus considering also not only the cycle stock between reorders but also uh, the safety stock that uh, covers the uncertainty of the demand of this period so that uh, they can be certain with certain probability not to run out of stock right and they will determine their uh, stock levels and the frequency of supply uh, also considering the lead time and the, uh, and the also the variability of demand at this period as uh, after you read you relate to the continuous replenishment models shown in the book and on the transportation side, in our oil projects, as I briefly mentioned about, um, equipment transportation uh, will be using our supply vessels. And for example, this image shows the supply vessel loading in Namibia in a previous project we had there. And this type of vessel is a very specialized uh, for this kind of operation. It, uh, it carries this deck cargo you can see, but also underneath the deck, it carries some bulk cargo and additional to the supply vessels we are going to use helicopters to transport the personnel and once in a while some small equipment when we need to hurry this small equipment and when supplying for the small retailers in a city we are using mostly trucks uh, for example this delivery truck in mexico city uh, we may have the challenge of uh, some very narrow roads for example in this case uh, is in, in the center, historical center of Bogota, where roads are very narrow and we cannot use a large truck. And so, and they are also starting to use different types of equipment. For example, this picture here, it shows the, some delivery tricycles that Coca-Cola is using in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. And this type of transportation used is very interrelated with the warehousing and the entire network design of our system. For example, uh, here in the first image uh, is one example of a network modeling that where we had uh, in the oil company multiple projects everywhere in the globe, and we want to have a and we want to have a central base um, for stocking some equipment. Uh, we studied multiple can candidate locations for this central base, and considering multiple criteria, we decided to place the base in the Netherlands. Additional to the central base in Netherlands, each project has its own supply base. For example, in this image is the 
is the design for the logistics design for the project in Tanzania, where we kept our helicopters in Dar es Salaam, the largest city of the country, and we had uh, and we operated uh, the cargo, the equipment from this small port uh, in another city, and all the equipment would arrive into the country uh, through this larger city, Dar es Salaam, and we will move to the our port we were operating from by trucks. And we use the helicopters and the supply vessels operating from Dar es Salaam and the uh, Mituara to supply the platform with personnel and equipment. This is uh, an isolated project in Tanzania. And for larger uh, production basins, where we actually have a large production, for example, Campus Base in Brazil, Gulf of Mexico, close to Louisiana, United States, Nigeria, Angola, North Sea between England and Norway, in these large basins, there are multiple bases set up where we'll be running many projects. And around this base, there will be suppliers and hundreds of supply vessels and helicopters operating from the, from the ports to the platform. And this image here shows the case of Macaé in Brazil. It's the main uh, oil base in Brazil, where local companies have set up multiple bases around the city including in Rio de Janeiro, uh, for supplying different uh, regions of the production base. And then they fly helicopters and run the supply vessels from these different bases to the drilling platforms. And when we talk about uh, supplying to the small companies in Mexico City, we are also trying to set up a network of warehouses and transportation, but the problem is quite different. In this case, we probably want to have a central warehouse somewhere outside the city, and we use large trucks to bring the material to local warehouses inside the city. And from these local warehouses, we either want to supply directly to the customer using small trucks, or maybe we can even set up secondary warehouses, smaller warehouses, where we supply these warehouses also using trucks, and then from the secondary smaller warehouse, you can supply, as I mentioned, using, for example, tricycles or smaller uh, vehicles that I showed up earlier to use to supply the final customer. And there are different ways to set up this network of warehouse and transportation. And it's actually a very interesting problem to try to optimize uh, all the different uh, variables involved uh, in this kind of problem. And of course, the problems of supplying the platforms and the small retailers are so different that um, to measure the operations, we're going to use different metrics to measure and to optimize. Um, in this case, in the case of the oil, uh, petroleum drilling, as I mentioned, the cost of operating is $1 million per day. So we want to be very responsive. We want to attend the demand very fast. We want to have a, a called the responsive supply chain so that the main metrics that we are going to use for the logistics is what we call downtime due to logistics. This means how much time the drilling rig loses or how much time the drilling rig, the drilling rig was idle waiting for equipment because of logistics. Also another metric because of the risk of accidents, another metric we follow very closely is the rate of accidents. Of course, we always want to have zero accidents Unfortunately, not always we get uh, zero accidents, but that's our goal, that's our aim. On the other hand, for supplying more stores in the city, we are trying to set up a very efficient supply chain, what we call efficient supply chain in contrast to responsive supply chain. And we are going to look at the cost to serve each customer, that's a main metric, cost to serve each customer, and we look at the service level, which is also the other metric, which is the availability of our product to our service, as we always want to have these customers provide with our product, if possible, at the lower cost. And in the topic of global supply chain, as I mentioned uh, for the oil company, we're talking about large companies with major suppliers in many locations of the world. So we're going to be mobilizing through different locations of the world uh, and thus considering transportation, customs, import taxes, and uh, many restrictions that uh, have been each time more common. 
In the coordination of the supply chain, we coordinated the entire supply chain through management structures. In the case of the company, their management structure set up a, a communication processes that involve all the parties so they can coordinate everything together. Very often coordinate the operations together and they use not only email and phone calls, but they're having more recently different systems for communication. Um, not only for the operations, but also for the contracting issues. So um, a very structured uh, communication process. And for supplying uh, small companies, there is usually very little coordination because there is very limited uh, communication. And um, But right now there is a very interesting revolution going on. And my project is very much related to this revolution. Because today the store owners are having access to internet, and they have uh, smartphones, most of them today have smartphones. And so we start to have a very interesting digital transformation going on in the supply of these more stores. Because more stores are adopting applications or joining e-commerce platform for ordering, for selling, to ent for entering into e-commerce. And for, so, for example, uh, here this application called Bees from Ambev, uh, this is for the small stores to order their products from Ambev through the application. So it's not necessary so much uh, a sales representative, sales representative knocking the door every week or placing phone calls. And another very interesting application is this one called the Z Delivery, also from Ambev, where uh, where the final customers order to Ambev their products. So the final customers enter the application, order the projects, but then Ambev forwards the order to a nearby small stores so that uh, the small store can supply the customer directly. So it's a very interesting coordination that is going on here. And there are many different business models popping up everywhere that are taking advantage of this interesting digital revolution that is going on today in this environment of uh, the small stores in developing countries. Okay, so this was a very brief overview of all the topics that Danica covered in her book and how they work in practice in these two very different industries. I hope you find it interesting that these topics are very different in each of these industries, but as you can see, they actually do apply in the two different industries. I hope this was useful. I hope you have a nice learning experience. Goodbye.